Barney Pongo Zuckerman was our associate director and associate professor at the School of Anthropology, and as well as the curator of archaeology at the Arizona State Museum. And we were all very, very sad when she moved to the University of Maryland this last year. Uh, as an Hi. Um, I'm, can you hear me? Is it okay? All right. Um, I'm happy to be here <laughs> again. Um, and I just want to thank Diane for making it possible for me to come back and have a little bit of a reunion. Um, it kind of feels like I've just been on sabbatical and I'm, yeah. <laughs> Except for I don't have a house to stay in anymore. So. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm just thrilled to be here and to see you all and to um, reconnect with, with friends, even though it feels like I been gone all that long. It's only been a couple of months. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our field school at Mission Guavavi, Los Santos Angeles in Guavavi. And um, this is a project with an interesting history, but it's a collaborative project between uh, the University of Arizona, the National Park Service, and Desert Archaeology. Um, and I've listed my two um, co-PIs on the project. Homer Teal, um, who was down uh, downtown being a 1980s Tucsonan at the Presidio, but I didn't see him this morning in that photographic evidence. <laughs> and um, uh, Jeremy Moss, who is the first service archaeology archaeologist at uh, Chino Conquering National Historic Park, and is now at, why do I always forget the name of this? Pecos. Thank you, Pecos National Historic Park. Thank you. So um, and just some history on uh, the mission, since um, we haven't heard too much of the historical <laughs> side of things. Um, mission Los Santos Angeles de Guavavi was a uh, keynote mission. It was established in the 1690s. Um, like most missions, it went without a resident priest for quite a long time. It didn't really become what we would sort of consider a real mission until um, the 1750s. Uh, there is standing architecture at Guavavi, and you can tour it during the high season. Um, if you go to Chimacarque National Historic Park, they do tours every other Saturday. So I highly recommend um, going to visit. So in 2000 and 11, I believe, yeah, 2011, uh, Jeremy Moss approached Barbara, Barbara Mills, um, about some contacts at the, the National Park that were being endangered by vehicular traffic, cows, and also roads. And um, he was wondering if the university would like to do a field school at um, the mission. Um, and of course, being a Spanish colonial archaeologist, albeit a zoo archaeologist, um, Barbara asked me if I was interested in doing that. And I said, yes, but. <laughs> yes, but I'm the associate director of the school, and I'm, so, I'm a zooarchaeologist. I don't usually run very large field programs like this. Um, I want to work with Homer. So if I can work with Homer, and Homer and I will teach this field school together, I'll do it. So Barbara said, yep, let's find a way to make it work, find a way to pay him, and, and let's do it. So that's how we ended up with the three collaborators, and Jeremy Moss as well uh, was there until the end of So you can see on the upper right, this is a pointer. Um, upper left, sorry. Uh, this is an erosion belly that's um, getting <coughs> inches closer every year to an adobe structure map that's behind it that we now know is, is mission period. Um, okay, so let me show you. Oh, yeah, so this is a picture of the co project directors, um, Homer Teal, me, formerly U of A, and, uh, and Jerry <laughs> Moss. So some of the research themes that, um, that we were interested in as we went into this project, obviously we had this opportunity, and it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to work on national park property, which um, really does not happen very often. Um, I'm really interested in the Native American experiences under colonialism, and so that was one of my um, areas of interest um, to work at Guavavi. Um, and also, there hasn't been a lot of archaeology done at missions. So a lot of the archaeology that has been done has been done by Desert Archaeology, and Homer was the one who was doing that work, which is why I wanted to work with him. Um, but when you look at most of the knowledge about the missions in this area, it's been kind of dominated by a mid-20th century um, approach, which was basically looking at these uh, missionaries as being run by these missionary heroes, these intrepid guys who would go out onto the frontier and to try to eke out a living and civilize the Indians, right? Which is, of course, a very biased and um, very uh, incorrect uh, look at the way the missions operated. So I really wanted to kind of bring mission scholarship into kind of a more contemporary understanding and also to place missions <coughs> in a broader colonial context. So these were not isolated frontier outposts as they are traditionally depicted. They were tied economically to what else was going on in the region. I wanted to know if that was. 
Um, I'm a zooarchaeologist, so I'm really interested in the introduction of livestock and the exploitation of livestock products um, at Native American sites during the historic period. And so that was sort of the, the knowledge and the approach that I brought to this project. And the other sort of practical side of it was to help the Park Service to better understand the full um, occupational history of the site. So we know that there were some prehistoric components, and we wanted to know a little bit more about that, ironically, since I'm a historic archaeologist. Um, and we also wanted to know what some of the other buildings were um, on the site that may or may not be mission grade. So that was, those were our primary research goals for the project. So we did three field seasons at Mission Bobby, and we just finished our final field season um, this year in the spring. And our field school was run a little bit like a hybrid between uh, the northern Arizona field schools and the southern Arizona field schools. Um, we did weekends, and then we had one big camping trip over spring break. Um, when we did our field work, and then during the, the uh, week at the University of Arizona, we had our field school course. So um, we had all of our students who were from the University of Arizona. Um, we had mostly undergraduates, one graduate student who joined us. Um, and yeah, and my son uh, was also an honorary. <laughs> and my mom actually took the pictures. Built in the end. was left in a tent and took care of my seven months. Okay, some other key personnel that I need to introduce. Um, some of them are in the room. Um, we've got Nicole Mathuk in the back. Just the way you put them. One of my teaching assistants for all three years, uh, volunteer or paid, um, Lasse Aragon. And um, I don't think Matt is here. Matt Pales? Okay. He's in Mexico. Good. <laughs> so these are my three intrepid TAs or other graduate students that worked on the project, volunteered or were paid in various capacities, but they were the the field TAs. And I need to introduce and um, acknowledge we had three site monitors from, that were provided by the Tono Foundation, um, and I'll introduce them. Um, Jeffrey Francisco was with us for all three years. Uh, he was absolutely amazing and um, was never content to just monitor. He was always helping whatever needed to get done. He was always there. Um, Lisa Palacios was a um, site monitor our first season in, in, the, um, in the field, the second season. She was finishing up her master's in American Indian Studies and asked if she could take the class as a field school student. So she was a student in our third year, or our second year, sorry. Third year, she was on maternity leave, but she then applied to the School of Anthropology for the PhD program, <coughs> and she will be the first PhD archaeologist, or Tomanathan archaeologist, when she graduates in a few years. So um, I'm really excited for her, and I hope to be on her committee from afar. <laughs> and then Anthony Sweezy in the lower right, um, he, uh, was with us for the first two years. And the first year, he basically took the, the field school with us. He, he kind of just said, I'm, you know, I'm just going to do it. And so he just was an archaeology student along with everybody else. And at the end of his first, the, the first field season, he was hired by Desert Archaeology to be um, a field archaeologist. So anyways, it's been a wonderful uh, relationships um, with the, the monitors and now students and employees. So just some images from camp life. Um, we spent eight days camping at the Santa Fe Ranch, and they were happy to welcome us. They're an um, outreach kind of organization. They do a lot of environmental education and sustainable <coughs> ranch education. So they were thrilled to have us come to camp with them. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of crying and tears, <laughs> but only for my children. And the occasional animal visitors. We did, we did get visited by a family. <laughs> once or twice. Uh, so this is the map that was originally um, done by Desert Archaeology. They had done a, a, a free survey um, of both Mojave and Calabasas and other missions as part of the Mutakari National Historic Park. So we're going to be updating this map now that we've done our work. But using what Homer um, and Mike Brack had um, surveyed um, back in 2011, we sort of targeted uh, a few areas that we were interested in and also that the Park Service wanted us to work on. So first, let me point something out. This boundary here is actually the National Park Service property. The rest of it is owned by the city of Manalis or is on private land. And so we were working with different land jurisdictions. Um, <coughs> it really got complicated at times, and I thank Bill for helping us work through some of those permissions and, and uh, hurdles. Um, so we were working just in one context on National Park Service property, and that was the middens being dug up by roads, and so they were keen to have us come look at it. And then a couple of contacts on city of Manalis property um, these, um, I'll talk about, they were uh, seen by earlier archaeologists and, and noted as being weird clearings with a funny colored soil, and so I'll talk a little bit about those. We looked at this adobe structure that's being 
brought over. Um, and then we looked at a um, pit house area uh, that's all along this ranch road. And again, these things um, are continually uh, run over by the Border Patrol and ranching trucks and archaeologists. Um, okay, so this is a, a couple of images of the Boacom period. And we've got radiocarbon dates back on some of these features in May. But it was actually earlier than we thought, so they go back to about 8,800 to 1,100. Um, and of course, I'm not a Boacom archaeologist, so I'm just going to gloss over things randomly. If you have questions, you can ask Homer. Um, uh, one thing I will say is this is a roasting pit. And everybody looked at it and said, well, this is the most beautiful roasting pit I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. This was actually in the middle of the road, and you could see the rocks on top. And the cars were just driving right over this thing. Um, the uh, rancher who came out and saw this, and he's like, oh my god, I've been running this over for 30 years. I <laughs> so it was beautifully preserved. We actually suspected that was going to be mission grade, but it's not. It's well come. Um, this is some interesting carved object, but we're not really sure what it is. Maybe fire starter, uh, maybe a pickup <coughs> kit. There's many theories, we're not really sure. Um, but you can see in the road uh, at least seven or eight different Boacom pit houses um, that were just dark stains. Homer portions of extra vision, so you can see these things that run along. Um, and we mainly suck Leslie out in the road because it's really compacted, and um, she likes to hit things with the um, so that was uh, <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> okay. So um, what we learned from this is that this is uh, the largest known Boacom pit house village from this part of the Santa Cruz River Valley. So that's very, very exciting. We just don't have any um, evidence of these large pit house villages. And these seven or eight, actually it's more than that, that we identified <coughs> are just in the road. So that doesn't count the things that are on either side of the road that we can't see because um, there's growth. Okay, so this is that mission era adobe structure. I'm, I'm not shivering because I'm nervous, I'm freezing. Um, <laughs> um, ironically, coming from Maryland, I'm cold here. So I'll point out a few things here. So this was a, a structure mound that had been noted by, by previous archaeologists and mapped, and they could see that there were walls and they could see how many rooms there were. Um, there is a road that's cutting the corner um, of the structure mound. And so what we did is we just scraped the map initially in the road to see what, if we could find the edge of that structure. And I don't know if you can see this in the back, but there's some zebra striping right here. And that's actually 13 courses of adobe bricks that we were able to identify. So what happened was, and then this, this lighter material right here is the foundation. So the wall of the structure fell out into the, into the road, and we were able to see the adobe and, and the, the mortar uh, in between those bricks. When we excavated inside the structure, we found um, initially burned beams, um, so the big beams, <coughs> yes. and then um, on top of that, we found fire roofing material. You can see Homer is, is holding um, some of the mud that's been fired by the structure fire when the, when the building burned down. Um, and you can see the impressions of the latias, the small beams that um, went in between the big beams. And then when we got down onto the floor, it was very clean. There was not much there except for a layer of fine dust. So we know that the structure was open for some, abandoned for some period of time before it caught fire. And then the roof collapsed, and then at some point the walls um, exploded, at least at this time. So, but we did find those, both architectural evidence and artifacts that indicated that this is a mission period adobe. Um, we thought initially we were thinking, well, maybe this was an early church, um, but there's interior walls that you can see right here, and also a side entrance that would suggest that this was not a this was probably a residential dwelling. We found um, evidence for um, a corner hearth in one of the rooms. So this was probably some sort of dwelling, but we don't know who the dwelling. So in our first season, we were able to work in the Mission Midden. So this is where the Mission was throwing most of their trash. Um, and this is on National Park Service property. And you can see one of our really terrible looking two by two units right here. And the reason why that thing looks more like a trapezoid, right? Trapezoid? <coughs> yeah, trapezoid. Um, is because it was on a one heck of a slope <laughs> like this. And it was really hard to maintain straight walls. I think we lost about a half a meter by the time we got down to the bottom of it. Anyways, so I'll show you a few things that we found um, in the midden. But first, I'm going to point out a couple of things that we didn't actually find, but I have on the slide anyways. Um, this is a lead um, a cross, a handmade cross, and we found this actually one of the other features, but I put it in here because I have lots of pictures. <coughs> anyway, so a handmade 
locally made by Cross, of course, this suggests that all this is mission period. Um, and this is uh, a fragment of Chinese porcelain that was um, found in the 1960s excavation um, that were led by Bill Robinson in uh, Montana. Okay, so some of the things that we found at the, the midden were sort of evidence of the global connections of the, or the global connectivity um, of the Spanish colonial missions during this time period. Um, the thing that got Jeremy to jump up and down was the peach pit, the short peach pit. Peach pit. Um, they'd been reconstructing the orchard at Tomb Cockery, and so this was direct evidence that it was probably an orchard um, at Mufabi as well. Um, we found uh, on ceramics. Um, this is uh, a projectile point, I think, for hunting hummingbirds. Um, <laughs> 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 that's a survivory point. I've just never seen anything that small in my life. Um, and then here's a fragment of Chinese porcelain. Uh, my mother is actually holding it to recognize that hand. Uh, this is a, a glass bead from either Czechoslovakia um, or possibly Venice. This is a fragment of Spanish olive jar that would have been used to ship olives or olive oil. Um, and then uh, local uh, maize uh, cobs uh, that were charred in, in the, um, oh, and then Mexican oil. So what's, um, what I usually, when I give tours, I would ask, does anybody know how Chinese porcelain got to southern Arizona in 1750? Other than Jeff, because I know he does. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'll explain. In, in, the, in the 18th century, the Philippines was a Spanish colony, and so Spanish galleons would land at the Philippines, and the Philippines already had a, a long trade history with China, and so the Spanish galleons would land in Manila, and they would load up on Chinese porcelain, and they would ship that to the coast of Mexico, the Chinese porcelain would be loaded onto mule trains, be shipped to Mexico City, and then loaded on another mule train to come all the way to southern Arizona. In 1750, so the priest could drink his tea, I suppose, out of Chinese porcelain, so that he could have China here in southern Arizona in 1750. And that's a good indication of what material culture meant um, for these gentlemen, who were usually the second-born or later sons of wealthy families in Europe. So it was very important for them to have the trappings of elite status, even though they felt they were sort of living, um, eking out this living on the frontier and dying of malaria and whatever else. Anyway, so that is to me kind of fascinating. So we think about Chinese exports as being a recent thing. Um, nope, it was back in 1750. <laughs> okay. Um, so in 2013, um, we had the uh, oper we have one of the opportunities of working with Desert Archaeology is you get access to their staff and their technology and their incredible knowledge. So uh, Mike Brack from Desert Archaeology came out with, um, well, let's just say he did some above ground <laughs> photography. <laughs> they might have been, well, I'm not going to get into that. So there were some photographs taken from very tall heights that did not go on federal property. Um, <laughs> uh, so we found, uh, when we got these photographs back, at the end of the field season, so too late to do anything about it, were these curious um, alignments. And I'm not sure if you can see them, and if I can even make them out from where I am. But do you see a line here and a line here? OK, so we were like, ah, lines in the ground. There's a structure out there. So then um, we went out and looked, and sure enough, we could see little plants that were growing in little green lines all over the all over the site. So the next season, we went out um, to try to excavate. What we thought was it was going to be some <coughs> spectacular multi-room adobe compound structure, you know, like some sort of massive thing. Um, when we got out there, what we realized is that those were not representing adobe walls necessarily, they were representing trenches. And that makes sense. Um, and what we found about 10 centimeters down in this huge area, so you saw those two big ovals that I had highlighted earlier, um, about 10 centimeters down is this really hard surface. And at this point, we don't know what it is. It's not caliche, it's not carbonate. We don't know how it formed. Um, but it is, it's extremely hard, it's like concrete. Um, in some areas, it's extremely smooth. You can almost vulgar dance on it. In other areas, it's pitted and looks curiously like a muddy paddock. <laughs> um, and in fact, when the rancher came out and we said, does this look like hoofprints to you? He said, yes, that's what it looks like. It looks like my paddock after the rain. Um, so our theory at this point is that it is probably a mission period corral, but we still have no idea how this thing, how this surface formed. Um, we also don't know there's trenches that are cut through. You can see remodeling. Um, they probably put, there's burned posts 
Um, this is Lisa <coughs> sitting with that gigantic burned post. Um, so we know that these were wall trenches. Um, and I'll show you in a sec some contemporary examples of, of these types of structures. But we can't really figure out at this point what all we have. There's, there's some individual post holes that are maybe <coughs> go through this stuff, but probably were there and then the surface formed around it. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what this is. We have some thin sections that we've sent off to Susan Menser, one of the School of Anthropology's PhDs, um, former PhDs, uh, to take a look at for us and see if she can figure out what the heck this stuff is. Vance came out. Where's Vance? Holiday. He was here. Um, he came out to help us do it, and we were all puzzled. We even did an acid test. Okay, so this is an overview of <coughs> what we are now interpreting as a, um, a mission era livestock trail. Um, we, this is mission period because we know from the artifacts, we found the cross, we found um, uh, cattle, bone, sheep bone, fox, um, and then also artifacts of them, uh, uh, ceramics as well, and then lithics. So we know that this is firmly a mission period feature, and we're still trying to figure out um, exactly what this is, and I'm not sure that we'll be able to map out ramadas or or many structures that were part of, of this corral feature. Uh, but this is actually at Santa Fe Ranch, this wall right here. And so we think this is probably a reasonable model for what the, um, the, the walls would have looked like for the corral during the mission period. Um, so uh, we've been working with Doug Dan a little bit, and he might help us to do a little reconstruction of what this thing may, might have looked like. But again, we think this may have been a muddy corral that somehow got frozen in time, but we don't know the sort of chemical mechanisms for how that might have happened. So the interesting thing about this is we don't know of any other mission period livestock features. We don't, nobody's really looked at this and nobody would really even know what to look for. And so now at least we have a model to know what we should be looking for to look for some of these mission outbuildings. There's been a lot of focus on the mission architecture, usually the church, um, but really not as much about the mission landscape. So that's sort of an interesting um, contribution of the project that um, will hopefully help scholarship moving forward. So we've been also involved in a lot of um, outreach and other activities that I'll talk very briefly about. Um, the National Park Service Home Office through the Latino Initiative funded two of our field seasons helped with our field work um, as we ran a parallel program that was coordinated by uh, the Environmental Education Exchange, which is a nonprofit here in Tucson, to bring Latino high school students and teachers to the field with us at Bobby for not too long, but day or two, and then they ran um, an extended program for these high school students and teachers on archaeology and <coughs> heritage um, in uh, Tucson. And some of those high school students are now um, <coughs> undergraduates at the University of Arizona and even visited the anthropology table um, at the career or the majors, the junior majors day, as Nicole told me yesterday. So um, we're hopefully recruiting some more archaeologists um, into the full students program as well. Um, and here they are at the screens. Um, and that was really a lot of fun to work with, with those guys. We also have been working with um, another high school teacher, Alex Ruff. He's a, um, a biology forensics and coach at uh, Marana High School. And we got a grant through the Research Corporation for Science Advancement to have Alex work with us for several summers to do research. And this is basically to sort of um, bring science into the classroom and for him to translate what he's been doing on campus into educational opportunities for his students. And so Alex has been working with Nicole on a stable isotope project. So Nicole um, is a archaeologist and is looking at um, the uh, role of livestock at, at Bobby. And so we're trying to see if maybe we can track the seasonal movements of livestock as well as foddering and free ranging and watering practices. So Nicole has been working with Alex on that project as well. And we also do many, 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 many tours. That's um, sort of the, the job of the field school director, right? As we all know, is to do the tours. So um, that's me and a couple of students giving a tour to a group of fifth graders. One fifth grader asked, as somebody was digging, one of the undergraduates was digging a square hole, um, if somebody was digging from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Even her friends just burst out laughing. Nobody could it was adorable. It knows more about archaeology now. That's the real way China. That's the real way China. Yeah. <laughs> we were also, I just, um, I had to show this photograph. We were very lucky to have some of the um, original members of the 1960s crew um, come to visit, um, one of whom is no longer with us. So I just want to acknowledge Jim Ayers and how wonderful it was to come. He 
even though he was quite ill at the time. And also Jeff was there too to come visit. So thank you for coming, Jeff. So on the, the left is Bunny Fontana. When I first met him, um, he said, I said, hi, Bunny, I'm Barney. And he said, hi, Barney, I'm Bunny. I think we switched names. <laughs> And on the right was the director of the, of the of field project, Bill Robinson. So it was just really neat to have them all there and, and visiting with us. So just to um, pull it all together before I show you a cute animal slide. Um, <laughs> what we found so far, uh, and this is, you know, we just finished our last field season, so we're putting it all together now, is the largest known Hoacom village um, in the region, um, which is pretty exciting. We just don't know too much about this time period um, in very southern Arizona, so we're learning uh, more about it. Um, and also we see that the missions participated in this global economy. So really the, the origins of the modern kind of world economic system that we're living in, you can trace back even earlier, but in southern Arizona back to 1750, right, in the desert, they had stuff coming from all over the world. This was a, a double transoceanic trade, trans-Pacific and transatlantic trade, that was all coming to southern Arizona. This was um, a, certainly not the frontier for the Atom. And um, you know, it's debatable. And then this was really connected to, to a global economy. Um, and of course, this was all driven by Atam labor, all driven by ancestral Atam labor. Um, and as a zooarchaeologist, I would say that a lot of this was based on, as we know from the animal plant evidence, on animal products like, like tallow and hide. Um, so there's a lot of stories to be told um, in the bones, especially. OK, so I, here's your obligatory cute animal slide. We had, the, the honor of seeing many animals born, uh, not my son, but goats <laughs> and calves. <laughs> and we also rescued this dog. Um, this is Homer in the back of my stepdad's car. We found a, a near-death dog at the site. Actually, Mike Brack found the dog, and we managed to get it to somebody who brought it to a vet, and the dog, much to our surprise, survived, and is now living a wonderful, um, I guess, retirement. Depends on how old he was in Maine, so the dog is doing just fine. Anyways, and then uh, baby goats and uh, baby hominids. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, many, many, many people think, and I won't read the whole thing off. Uh, but yes, this is uh, one of those projects that we, uh, I think there's probably very few people in this room that didn't contribute to <laughs> one way or another. Um, and I especially want to acknowledge Bill and congratulate you <laughs> on the award. Um, and then also introduce him since he's our, our next speaker. So um, Bill Doley is the president of Archaeology Southwest and the CEO of Desert Archaeology Incorporated and has been a long time, right? All right, okay. <laughs> and has been a long time collaborator with the School of Anthropology. So I'm very pleased to be the one who gets to introduce him. Thank you.